the ninth. The ninth man also wore a beard, black as night and gray, like traces of ash over coals. He too wore the white wrap of his brothers before him. He looked into the traveler's eyes and bowed his head before speaking. My brothers, whom you have met, rekindled your father's torch from dying embers. But even my family, whose golden age would allow a continuation of thought amidst darkness, would succumb to the same affliction that infected our cousins. Within my family, a blight took shape to cause our golden thought to wane. A very brother, one not touched by your father, but by another, had made his attack. He sought to discredit my colleagues with whom you spoke, and immediately gained a following significant enough to forever change the character of my family from one which saved thought to one which defied thought. I sought to counter him, but his draw was too strong, and all I achieved was the addition of one further name to that list of those who followed the way of your father's children. I reinforced the way of my colleagues, not such that it would continue in my family, for my family was by then lost, but so that my cousins could find it again, so that they could later harvest it as we had before. The traveler spoke. Man avoids complexity when he seeks immediate ease, but this invites those complications that inevitably arise from issues neglected. You of all people were charged with disbelief in God, first by brothers and then by cousins. Indeed, it was cousins that found you when you had been discarded in favor of mindlessness. Man looks too closely to himself and yet sees little of his own personal truth. With ease comes comfort, and so he imagines what will comfort him. He imagines himself as something more than he is. This world, through which you passed, continues to exist, and within the eternal universe it shall always exist. It is different now than then, just as it was never the same before. Entities exist limited in time. They come and go with the constant changing of matter, with the evolution of the sentience that guides them. The traveler stopped. He looked out over the wide grassland. Again he spoke. The man that attempts to establish by limited means that which is infinitely complex is a fool. And yet to stem the movement of thought on that basis takes far greater foolishness. Again he stopped and paused. Again he continued. Man has the ability, even the responsibility, to propel his evolution. He may do so by two vehicles, his knowledge and his imagination. But remember, no entity, including man, may see objective truth. All are limited to the perspective of their subjective nature. Knowledge is man's comprehension of environment, and knowledge may build on itself. But to gain true fruition, knowledge must look to the imagination for the landmarks of the horizons of man's mind. But the mere seeking of knowledge is infinite and static. Man must choose where he will travel. He may choose from what he already knows, and thus not evolve at all. He may choose from amongst landmarks of imagination and evolve, but evolution may be static in value, even negative. Finally, he may, by his imagined comprehension of universal harmony, seek the knowledge that allows his movement towards that. The traveler paused again. Briefly, he closed his eyes. He continued. Your brother, in attacking the gains your family made, showed his own ignorance. He failed to comprehend the truth of objective nature when he complained of your colleague's failure to prove the existence of God. There is no proof of God available to man, nor to any other entity. Such is the pure nature of God. The man spoke. But this does not mean one should not seek. No, it does not. Man should pursue knowledge of God. After all, sentience is the ability to pursue understanding, and the first step in that sentient pursuit must be to understand oneself and one's environment. It is in this way that man makes his choices. By those choices he evolves, and only by evolution may he achieve harmony. In his youthful insecurity, man gives undue importance to himself. He limits his comprehension by considering his world to be more than an infinitesimally small aspect of the universe. The man spoke. It is not so small that you have not come. The traveller responded. That is true, and yet I exist in lesser places than this, and in greater places. It is not that man is not important, but that man's importance is different to what he perceives it to be. I shall explain. Your brother, in his critique of your colleagues, failed to comprehend the twofold nature of God, God in itself and God as the extent of existence. 
Man thinks of God as thinking, as perceiving the particulars of existence. God does not do this, neither in regards to that which is relatively significant, nor to that which is relatively insignificant. God simply is all at once, and thus nothing at all. Existence is God's manifestation, all possibility embodied, an infinite array of finite comprehension and influence. Knowledge is itself a mere aspect of manifestation. This is where your cousin's misguided notion of self-importance lies. They equated the influencing energies of superior beings to God itself, whilst denying the existence of the many gods. The man, his head low, spoke. I can tell that you know my life. It was on these points and others my colleagues were attacked. I attempted to defend, and yet even my own brothers preferred thoughtlessness over thought. In time, my tradition lost the gift that had been given to my brothers before me. Our golden age died and became the darkness from which we had come. We lost the light we carried, but by then our cousins were ready to take up the torch, and so all was not lost. As the man looked up with his final hopeful words, the traveller's voice met his ears one last time. It was not on that basis that all was not lost. Your cousins too were destined to fail, hence my presence. The man turned and walked away. He walked twelve paces to join his colleagues and stand with them in the arc across the width of the road. As the man took his place, the figure to his left stepped forward and approached the traveller.